Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. His energy was appalling. <laughs> Big ideas only. Let him borrow an elephant, and that elephant walked on the bridge. Was it meant to, to stand forever? Uh, forever. <laughs> and there was other, like, spectacle that went along with that opening day, right? We have a lot of images of his booth with the daily joke on it. Um, but oh. I don't have the punchline. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't have a lot of the punchline. It's a good, good example of our, our hidden history that we need to celebrate. 150 years ago this July... The Eads Bridge, which connects East St. Louis and the city of St. Louis, was completed. It is a structure of distinction, not only for its design and materials, but also for its place in history. That includes major events with significance near and far. The Eads Bridge has also been a regional culture marker and a site for human connection and memorable characters. There's now an exhibit at the Missouri History Museum that commemorates the Eads Bridge's century and a half milestone. And joining us now to talk with us about it is Amanda Clark, public historian at the Missouri Historical Society and content lead for the Eads Bridge at 150 exhibit. Amanda, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Thanks for having me. So you have been an Eads Bridge historian and fan for many years. Had you been hatching a plan for this kind of exhibit for some time? I would say I was an Eadsbridge fan for a long time. I now kind of in a historian. (laughs) historian. Uh Um, I would say I wasn't hatching a plan, but I was definitely ready and eager when the opportunity uh, arose. This Mm -hmm. was it made it was like a dream opportunity to get to do. So take us back to the 1860s when the Eads Bridge was under construction. What is it that was going on in St. Louis? that made a bridge across the Mississippi River necessary. A a lot was going on in St. Louis then, right? And the um, business interests were growing and the railroads were coming more and more from the east and from the west. But they had to stop at the river, right? And everything gets off, gets on a ferry, has to cross over. So it's this it's this moment where St. Louis has to make a really bold decision uh, to move forward and to ke- to you know be able to compete on a much bigger scale. Mm-hmm. They've got to get that bridge. Yeah. Well, speaking of boldness, now there was some political pushback uh, from steamboat lobbies against building the bridge. Why is that the case? So they, I mean, for several reasons. The but one is. I mean, they would be losing their business, right? If, if we're now letting trains go across the river with freight, they're going to lose business, not just coming north and south on the river, but it was the ferry companies that were really holding on tight. Mm-hmm. Uh, those ferry companies were the ones that controlled, you know, when a train came to the waterfront, everything left that train, got on the ferry, was crossed over to the other side. And there was a particular company called the Wiggins Ferry Company that um, has just, they had a, not just a hold on all of the ferry traffic, they also owned most of the land at the riverfront on the Illinois side. So they owned the rail yards as well. Mm-hmm. So they really had a tight hold on that and a lot of control. Yeah. On both so sides. W- why is it that they did not prevail then? Finally, they, they we had people that um, were able to push harder, you know, like get up and above that. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a pretty uphill fight, and it held, held St. Louis back um, to get them to, you know, cross. And one of the my favorite parts of the story is that, you know, uh, e- e- in order to get the bridge built, at Eads had to get a – um, had to get an approval on the Missouri side and the Illinois side, right? Mm-hmm. One of the beauties of being two states right, right there. Right, right. And the Illinois politicians, he goes to a legislative session. He's a- expecting his approval. And, you know, they've got they've got some money in their pockets uh, that they've have re- received before this moment. Okay. And so they say, sure, you can have your bridge, but you can only put it in this one spot, knowing that that one spot is going to go straight into the city of St. Louis, making it impossible. So the other bridge ideas were north of downtown or south of downtown. Mm-hmm. This was going right into the city. Yeah. And so Eads is not defeated. He you know, walks back right right back in and says, fine, we'll go under the city as well. Oh. So not only was it a bridge, 
it's also the tunnel that goes mm-hmm. under, which had he built a tunnel before? No. Um, so he had to figure that out as okay. well. Well, and that gets to some uh, some questions that I have about James Buchanan Eads, whom the, the bridge is named after. Tell us about who James Eads was in his early life and about his interest in boats and rivers in particular. Yeah, James Eads is one of these great... Um, I'm glad St. Louis has him, right? Like he's one of ours to to put in our story. Um, he comes here in the 1830s as a young kid, um, and even the ride from Louisville to St. Louis tells us everything we need to know. I think about him, in that people uh, recalled being on the boat with him as his energy was appalling because <laughs> he was oh. so energetic, and he he was building models of steamships on the boat, bothering the pilot constantly, asking how things work, how does this go, how does that go. Um, so he was just really intense about it and was really excited to finally work on the river himself when mm-hmm. he was of age. So this this sort of personality, obviously the temperament, given what you've already shared, it, it sounds like it was necessary. He was also audacious in that the there were a lot of construction firsts with the Eads Bridge. It was the first in St. Louis. It was the first to use steel and the first and only bridge Eads built. So, I mean, with all of that said, it is no surprise that there were skeptics. I mean, why specifically did his plan have so many critics? So several reasons. One, like you said, he'd never done this before. And Eads was a self-taught engineer, meaning, and I think that's sometimes it's better when you come into something without all the baggage of what you think is going to work and not mm-hmm. work. And he didn't have that. He just came in and said, we're going to figure this out. Um, so, but there have been, um, you know, the engineers that came, they have, there's an engineering conference that comes to St. Louis that says this is not going to work whatsoever. Very similar to the story before, there was money in pockets already. Uh, there were several people that wanted to build a bridge here in St. Louis, mm-hmm. several different interests. And so it took, you know, Eads getting to the head of that that fight. And how long did that take? I mean, from sort of the the time that he maybe started talking about this design to lining pockets to actually (laughs) getting to the point where construction began. So it took well over a decade for all of that to go in. And the first plans were put forth not by Eads, but by other bridge designers in the 1830s. So Mm -hmm. this process had been growing uh, for several decades. Yeah. So you've been studying James Eads for years now, Amanda. What is it that fascinates you most about him as a a person? Yeah, as a person, he's just such a great example of someone who uh, has big ideas only, right? Like just everything he does is massive. And it's not, um, yes, he makes a fortune, but everything is about furthering, uh, furthering our city than furthering, you know, traffic all up and down the Mississippi River. And after he completes the bridge, he goes down to New Orleans and does this crazy project that deepens the uh, deepens the port of New Orleans and opens it up to international traffic. And then when he passes away in the 1880s, he's in the middle of a huge project trying to get a ship railway built in Mexico, okay. which that's one of those things you have to like, take a second and be like, what did, I, what did I just say? It's like, you know, take a ship out of the ocean, roll it down on these rails mm-hmm. led by steam locomotives and drop it back in. So just these incredibly big ideas that right. we have. So d- let's talk about the, the construction. What was it that made building this bridge particularly difficult, Amanda? One big thing. <laughs> what is the river? Uh, the river is, uh, you know, we can really focus on that one because the river is not just uh, – a body of water here, right? It is a fast-moving body of water. Mm-hmm. It is uh, murky, right? We've got that. Um, it is very different on both sides of the riverfront. On the Missouri side, you don't have to go that far to get to down to bedrock, which mm-hmm. Eads knew he had to do. So you don't have to go very far. But on the Illinois side, because that's where the water wants to go and it has where it has gone over however many years mi- rivers exist, um, it's really deep mud, like incredibly deep mud. And mm-hmm. so it, you had two very different problems on each side of the river to come across. And it's really wide here. So yeah. nothing had spanned that big, you know, that big of an area. Mm-hmm. Especially going, and then you had to sink those piers, get it to the bottom of the river. It's just a, so many things. Right. Now, the, the bridge was also the first to use something called caissons for its piers. 
What are caissons, Amanda, and why are they a, a big deal in the context of this bridge's construction? They're a huge deal. And usually this is one of the big stories that people ask about a lot. Um, so Eads is not the first to use caissons, but he learns about them in Europe. He takes a trip to Europe, learns about this new technology um, or this new way of building underwater. But what's big about his caissons is they are twice as deep that any had ever built. And, mm-hmm. and caissons sometimes can be really hard to explain, but really it's just it's a you know a room at the bottom of the river with a bunch of stones on top of it, and you keep digging out you're in that room, you're digging it out, there's pumping sand, and it pushes through, using gravity, pushes through the sand and river and mud to mm-hmm. get to the bottom. And so there is also uh, the discovery of effects related right. to that, right? Right. So about halfway down, uh, people start to get sick. Um, they start to feel health effects. It wouldn't be until on that eastern pier, the one that had to go really deep, uh, it wouldn't be until that was almost done, which is almost 100 feet below mm-hmm. the below the surface of the water to get to bedrock. And that's when people don't, not just getting sick, they start dying mm-hmm. uh, really quickly. And so that, that story is a big part of this story as well. Right. We're talking with Amanda Clark, who's public historian at the Missouri Historical Society and content lead for the Eads Bridge at 150 exhibit. This discussion about uh, what it took for the the bridge to be built, you know, it's often the case that building plans have to change for a, a variety of reasons. Some of them have to do with materials. Some of them are, are political factors uh, as well as others. Are you aware of any significant changes that had to take place in the course of the bridge's construction? There, yes, yeah, several changes had to, you know, had to. He, he was kind of, you know, he figured it out, but he also had to adjust things as he went. My favorite one, um, favorite is always a relative term as a historian because <laughs> it can be something that's kind of favorite is something weird. But uh, the one I most enjoy talking about is that a tornado actually hit the bridge while it was being constructed, while mm-hmm. that eastern pier was being dis- constructed. A tornado hits it. Uh, there are casualties from the bridge workers. And Eads then looks at his bridge design and adds a wind truss to it. So that makes it more stable, which would mm-hmm. come in handy when it would be hit by tornadoes again later later on in its life. Mm-hmm. And are there any records in the exhibit that pertain to the workers who actually did the constructing? So the best records we have are, you know, quotes about, um, you know, that experience of working underground. Uh, we have descriptions of them from the the work reports that the designers had. Um, it was it's. And we have some pace. We don't have pay stubs on display, but the Missouri Historical Society does have some pay stubs of those workers. Mm-hmm. And when the bridge was built, Amanda, did it have a certain lifestyle, a lifespan? That is, like, was there the idea in mind that the bridge would last a certain number of years, or was it meant to, to stand forever? Uh, forever. <laughs> and I love that question, because um, if you look at the other bridges in St. Louis down at the riverfront, you know, we have the new Stan Musial Bridge. And that's built to last 100 years, they say, um, which, you know, is interesting to like kind of give it a, a, a lifeline like that. But right. um, for Eads, though, he said this thing will stand as long as it's useful. And he said that at the opening of the bridge, and I love that he set us up as historians. He set us up perfectly mm-hmm. uh, to kind of look at how does the ch- bridge change? Because in some ways it doesn't. It's solid, but it changes in these subtle ways over the last 150 years to do what we need it to do and yeah. to be useful for St. Louisans. And because I'm sure this question is on many people's minds, how much did it cost to build this bridge? That is a great question, and one that I've, um, the only answer I know is a whole lot more than they thought it would. Yeah. <laughs> and the financing story of how they built this bridge and got the money is, to me, as intriguing as the building itself, because mm-hmm. Eads had to go to Europe multiple times. It's not just him. It's this whole team of people that are just working so hard to keep it financed, because they know it is not, they're not, in it, they're not in it for the money right, whatsoever, right. but they do have to get it built. Mm-hmm. And so the different creative ways they came up with to get financing yeah. is a great story. And it took several years for the construction to be completed, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you had to get those piers and stuff built. You had to get that tunnel built underneath St. Louis, and then you had to get the span, the big steel spans across the river. Mm-hmm. So let's go to uh, opening day. There were people who criticized uh, James Eads' plans as weak. 
But once it was finished, this bridge was done, he became, as you'd mentioned earlier, a local and national figure, if not a a hero. What was it that changed? Um, Well, on a simple level, you know, People were previous, everyone was proven wrong, right? And they were proven wrong a few days before the opening in a very uh, simplistic way that I get asked about a lot, which was uh, the elephant on the bridge. People always ask me, what about the elephant? Did they Mm -hmm. walk an elephant? And yes, several days before the bridge opened, uh, Eads had a local circus that was in town, uh, let him borrow an elephant, and that elephant walked on the bridge. And the idea was that an elephant wouldn't walk on something unstable. Mm -hmm. So that, and it walked and it was just fine. So that bridge, (laughs) that story really sticks with people. Right. And there was other, like, spectacle that went along with that opening day, right? Yeah, they had fireworks. They had um, Eads' face on a huge, big billboard, which I would give anything. In my, when I get my time machine, that's one of the one of the spots I'm going to go see because there are no photos. Um, but yeah, they had, it was a big, and most of St. Louis came to see it mm-hmm. open that right. day. Um, they also had, you know, mul- half a dozen steam locomotives linked together and drawn, you know, driven across the bridge by William Tecumseh Sherman, who was also a local celebrity after the Civil War. And um, he, he, you know, drags these things across to show how strong it is. Um, no one knew that the tunnel wasn't finished yet. So he just drives them across and hangs out in the tunnel until everybody goes home. And yeah, then they drive yeah. them back across because <laughs> the tunnel wasn't done. But yeah. So once the bridge was completed, did it then become the primary way that people would cross state lines? I mean, before the, the bridge, were they relying on the river to, to traverse? Yeah, the only way across before that bridge was was using, you know, ferries or you know, ferries of all sizes and flatboats and things like that. Um, so People were using it at the top deck was just a wood plank deck initially mm-hmm. for horses and people you know, walking across. Over time, that would have to be adjusted to handle the, as modes of transportation changed. Yeah. In the early 20th century, it's not, you know, just a couple of decades later, the city of St. Louis builds a br- their own bridge that was not a toll bridge. So a lot of people don't realize that the Eads Bridge was actually a toll bridge owned by a private company. Mm. And the so the city of St. Louis built a bridge to compete with that. Mm-hmm. And that bridge is still standing as well. Okay. So speaking of traversing and people uh, and tolls, there was a toll booth operator known as Charlie on the Bridge who was famous and beloved for telling jokes to commuters. Why did you choose to feature him in this exhibit? This is one of, I would say it is my favorite part of the entire exhibit, the chance to get to tell his story. Um, you know, it was a story of, you know, we've got all these big historic moments that happened on the bridge, but his story just perfectly encapsulated how something so big and so historic can be turned into an everyday moment. This was a man that worked as a toll booth operator from the 1950s to 1989, and he became a local celebrity and by doing these daily jokes and also knowing everyone that came through his booth every day, he kept incredibly detailed notes uh, saying who came through and so, and he just loved what he did. You could tell that he really took it seriously what his job was. Mm Do you know what any of those jokes are? <laughs> There's so many. But the funny th- thing about the jokes is that, that we have a lot of images of his booth with the daily joke on it, um, but okay. I don't have the punchline. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't have a lot of the punchlines, um, and the which is a funny thing to have of an issue as a historian to not have the punchline on it. Yeah. Um, there are no recordings of those radio spots that we can find, so... You know, but they're basically, if you think of any kind of just a really cheesy joke, right? It was right. on there probably. Oh, I know cheese <laughs> yeah. and corn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in so far as maybe what people might be able to tell you, what were the years again? He was so he starts working on the bridge in the late 1950s, mm-hmm. and he does he works there until 1989. Okay, when it closes, and in his archive, I'm gonna say his archives because the man kept an incredible. He had eight um, when I called his family to get you know asked them if it was okay to tell this story. And they're like, well, of course. And he kept eight scrapbooks of everything about this experience. Oh, wow. The last, some of the last pages included the tissue he cried into the day the bridge closed. Oh. And then he left, the day he left his toll booth. Okay. It was an amazing thing to, to find. And so, the last tickets that were, he had to give out, he kept those last tickets. Right. So the bridge closed. So it co- it closed. It, it switched ownership, right, mm. but to the city um, between the 
Terminal Railroad Association in the city of St. Louis. So he had stopped being a toll booth in 1989. And then he just goes to work a, a desk job at yeah. the Terminal Railroad Association and retires not too long after that. Okay. Well, and I had asked about those dates because if you know, if you're listening out there and you happen to remember maybe one of the, the punchlines that, <laughs> that Charlie had uh, to one of those cheesy, corny jokes, please don't send it our way. <laughs> now, the exhibit also showcases the bridge's role um, to a time in history uh, near the beginning of the, the century, and that is the 1917 East St. Louis race massacre. Mm-hmm. And that was when white mobs attacked and killed African Americans. Very, very different uh, set of, of circumstances. Mm-hmm. Thousands of residents fled from East St. Louis across the river to St. Louis seeking refuge. Amanda, tell us what that was like. Well, from the accounts that we have in this, you know, in, in I mean, we can't imagine what it was like having not been there. But, uh, you know, people were escaping across the bridge. The National Guard was stationed on the bridge to help that. But they weren't just helping people cross over. They were keeping St. Louisans, white St. Louisans, from going to Illinois. So there was a two-way s- struggle on that bridge. And, and mm-hmm. it's not clear whether the National Guard was, you know, fully protecting people or not. And so it... it it, something plays out there, right, yeah. in that event that is very very interesting and complex. Mm-hmm. And given that history and also, I mean, crossing a bridge from one state to another and sort of the, like, social or cultural um, trappings, I mean, maybe we can say, what are some of the things that, that the Eads Bridge represented insofar as this, you know, like one side and, and another dynamic? Yeah, over at, you know, and that has changed. The river itself over time has been this interesting barrier for us. I think, you know, in the colonial period, we are we are one country or one colonial territory, and Illinois is a different one, totally different country. That's crazy to think of. Uh, during, before the Civil War, before emancipation, we are a slave state. Illinois is a free state. So anything that's crossing between those two things, right, is, is really important symbolically. And then even as, you know, more modern times, our states are so different that anything that crosses the, the two really stands as a good, uh, can stand as a really good example of things that, that can connect and mm-hmm. that we should connect more, and it can stand as a symbol for that. Yeah. So the Eads Bridge today, as we said, in July, it turns a century and a half. Um, it did go through a rehabilitation process in 2012. So as far as bridges go, the ones that we have heard about in the news or the one that we've heard about is the bridge in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Now, people may be wondering about the Eads Bridge strength today. I mean, it was built to last forever, but I mean, do we have any reason at all to to worry about its stability? That's always a question that you wonder, like, you know, if I say, yes, it's going to stand forever, and then, you know, who knows what happens tomorrow, but maybe dragons arrive, right, and knock it down. But the bridge was overbuilt. He built it so incredibly strong. Um, any other design that was put forth for that bridge didn't go all the way down to bedrock. And because Eads knew the river bottom so well, it goes all the way to bedrock. So we've got that going for it. It's built of incredibly, str- you know, huge piers made of, st- uh, uh, of Missouri granite and limestone, holding it up. It's also been hit by barges. It has been hit by, um, it's had, you know, traffic hit it at different times. It has been hit directly by an F4 tornado in 1896, took a huge, that that would have done major damage. And the bridge, you know, it knocked some stuff off of the top, Mm -hmm. some stones off the top, but the bridge was perfectly fine. Yeah. So, I mean, what would you say then is the, the legacy of the bridge today? The legacy is, you know, playing out, right? Like as we, like you said, as our region is so fractioned off and we're thinking in terms of city and county and is the city this and the county, but the Metro East <laughs> and our region. And, and it's another great example and a great chance to connect all of those things and think of one St. Louis, right? Mm-hmm. And I also love that it's it's kind of hiding beneath the arch, this big national symbol. And it's has such a huge, it's a, it's a good good example of our, our hidden history that we need to celebrate. Yeah. And, you know, people can experience the, the Eads Bridge in a unique way because it is a pedestrian bridge, right? right? You can walk across it. People will be running mm-hmm. as well. Now, you've been at the history, uh, the Missouri Historical Society, that is, for a few years now. But I understand that your position as a public historian is something that's relatively new and that this was your first 
exhibit. I mean, how does that that feel? <laughs> That's pretty exciting. Um, as a as a someone who was a total history you know history kid and went to school for history um, and wanted to work in museums, knew that when I was in college, um, although this I could never imagined to actually get to start doing this, and so it's pretty dreamy. Uh, my career path is not linear whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's a, it's a good story in itself, but yeah, so this is a pretty exciting opportunity. Mm-hmm. And what is it that you hope visitors walk away with after visiting the exhibit? I hope they understand how a caisson works. <laughs> <laughs> That was really uh, something that was important to me because people talk about the caissons, but really, do we know how do they work? Yeah. Uh, so I, it's just I try to simplify it, make it easy, but also kind of appreciating beyond the engineering, which is a great story. Just yeah. How it, how important it is to St. Louis. Amanda, thanks for joining us. Thanks today. for having me. This episode was produced by Ella Cruzies. Audio engineering by Aaron Dorr. Podcast design by Roche Hemmings. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com.